Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Like Mother, Like Murder. In today's episode, we will be bringing you the story of J.C. Lee Dugard. J.C. is a beautiful mother of two who, when she was only 11 years old, was kidnapped and then held by her captor for the next 18 years. J.C. is a survivor and is such an inspirational, strong woman in every way, shape, and form. And as we go through many of the details included in this horrific story, I hope that you all take the time to fully capture exactly how truly amazing J.C. is. Welcome to Like Mother, Like Murder. I am Rachel. And I'm Heather. We bring you the good, the badass, and the crime. This is Like Like Mother, Mother, Like Like Murder. Murder. Welcome back to another episode of Like Mother, Like Murder. Hello. Welcome back to the big nine. Oh, wow. That blew my mind when you told me this is 90. Episode Blue 90. My yes. mind. Who do we Insane. think we are? I know. What what do we think we are? Podcasters? What's what do we think we are? Podcasters? <laughs> 90, you guys. Episode 90. Welcome back. Before we start, we are going to have a cheers to 90 because Heather needs it. <laughs> Oh, so bad. <laughs> I've been complaining to Rachel that I really want to try my espresso. More. I'm not going to lie. I had like the quickest sip because I literally could not. Do you see how full this it is? Very is? full. Yes. I couldn't like move it from the counter without taking a sip before. So cheers to 90. Cheers to 90. Cheers. Clink, clink. Yummy. How is it? Tell us about that espresso martini, girl. I am not going to lie. This shit slaps. Oh, this shit um, slaps. <laughs> it must be like, so the, this specific one I got from um, my brother's girlfriend. And she got it for me for my birthday. And I literally have never had an espresso martini before. Okay. And it came with like a little packet. And you just mix it with the vodka and some water and you pour it over ice and I am incredibly happy with it. I love that. Take I another sip. Say. I mm-hmm. am drinking a good old Michelob Ultra. Just a little beer right here, you know what I'm saying? And I'm also loving it. Mm. Because mm. I was watching Love is Blind earlier and I needed a beer. So, do I saw your post. I kind of need to catch up because beer. everyone is saying this season is like kind of off the crazy. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So, That's I think I'm honestly, I think I'm like two seasons behind potentially Catch because up, I was going to watch a more of it, but then same wonderful lady my brother's girlfriend the last time I was at their house she's like have you watched this and I'm like what is this and it's uh the ultimatum so that was my latest one and it was the best so So, good um I do need to catch up on some love is blind though love is blind is it do you think love is blind oh (laughs) (laughs) no (laughs) I did see a post though that um uh, Love is Blind was made for, oh my God, who's the couple from the first season who's still together? Cameron and... Yeah. I, Cameron and... Blah, Lauren. I want to say Lauren. Thank yeah. you. Um, And I saw someone make a, like, a tweet about it or something. It was like, Love is Blind was made for Cameron and Lauren, and the rest of the people are just like here for entertainment. <laughs> there are so many couples that have came out of it that I'm like, oh my gosh, so cute. So cute. All right. We ain't here for that. If you guys watch it, you guys know it's okay. We needed you to get a drink in there, you know? I know. (laughs) I'm loving it. It's exciting. But no, if you guys are watching Love is Blind, I would really love to hear what you have to say about it because (sighs) that's all I have to say about it. All right. You guys ready for today's episode? Are you ready for today's episode, Heather? I mean, yes and no. Yes and yes. Because oh. I just, I'm going to have to take a lot of breaths, I feel like. Um, you are. But I also, like, it's kind of spoiler alerted for me, obviously. Like, I know the the outcome, so I just have to remember 
that as we go through, but you know, it's going to be, it's, I will not say this is going to be a uh, lighthearted one. I will say that. No, (laughs) no, it is not. Um, you know, we, I talked about at the top of this episode and if any of you guys have heard JC Lee Dugard's name, you guys know that she she has quite the story. So we are going to be getting into that. I do want to say, though, to, to start, um, just so you guys are all aware, as we're talking about her, this story was actually recommended by my best friend, Crystal. Okay, so nice. shout out, Crystal. Shout out, Crystal. We very often, if you guys are not following us on our social media pages, we like to say, like, if you guys have a case that you recommend, please send them in to us, okay? Mm-hmm. Which she did. And she did. And she did. <laughs> Which is hilarious because I feel like she doesn't even like the crime stuff. Like, no. she latched on for the mom stuff and has, like, stuck around a bit, like, because it's all about the support, which we adore. But I love that she's the one who recommended <laughs> <laughs> well, and and we'll we'll get to exactly why, okay. but I I I also wanted to say so the funny part of her recommending this is I kept dismissing it. She kept she kept putting it out there and I kept dismissing it because I was thinking of the you know that show like that family that has a bunch <laughs> of kids 19 kids and counting or whatever. Dugers. Yeah. And he like did some bad stuff. So when that was sent, I just had that. <laughs> and it's it's crazy because I know this case. I did know you guys this have story. did you guys have a discussion where you're no. like, I don't want to do a case on the on the, the Oh yeah, eventually family. we did. And she and was she like, was like <laughs> she was like, Rachel, stop being dumb. Like that's exactly how that went. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it so much. Yeah. And it, it came down to the point where I was finally like, well, I guess I'm going to have to cover this because she's asked <laughs> third time's a charm, you know. And as oh, soon as I God. had typed in to start doing some research and, and JC's picture popped up, it all came back to me because I did. Yeah. I did know this case. I do yeah. know this story. And how you said that, you know, Crystal was here more so for the mom episodes. Mm-hmm. As we will get into this, JC was taken from South Lake Tahoe, and that is where oh, Crystal. That's her in 1991. Yeah. You know, oh, so frick, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this hits close to home for her. Okay, yeah, for but sure. That is, well, shout know, out Crystal. Thank you. For yes, this recommendation. Shout out. Thank you for this recommendation. <laughs> We're gonna get into it, guys. Here we go. You ready for it? No, 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 no. Just kidding. I'm not singing. Couple things. As a mother of a little girl, as someone who once was a little girl myself, as someone who just has big old feelings in general, every single part of what I will be saying in this first part absolutely breaks me. Yeah. Every single part. Um, I want to start here by giving the trigger warning that we will be discussing her kidnapping. We will be talking about her getting sexually assaulted and raped. I would not be doing this justice if I just brushed over certain parts of JC's story. So there will be details that may be hard or triggering. Mm -hmm. So please remember to take care of your mind and yourself while moving forward as a listener. Okay. Oh, everyone take a deep breath. <sighs> All right. We are going to start with JC herself. JC was born on May 3rd, 1980 to her mother, Terry and her biological father, Ken Slayton. He was not involved at all throughout her life. So that is all we say about him. Terry, on the other hand, is who raised her. She was her only daughter for many years until finally, uh, years later, Terry, she met Carl Proben and they got married and they had a daughter named Shayna, who then was JC's half-sister. In September of 1990, the family up and moved out of the Los Angeles area from Arcadia, California to South Lake Tahoe on the California side. 
They moved there because Terry wanted to take her family to be in an area that was going to be more safe to raise a family, right? So they, you think L.A. County. Yeah. And it's only Damn, getting worse, my I friends. I hate that. Like, that, 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 that that's she upped always, and moved. Like that, yeah, because right. I want to find somewhere, you know, better suited for my family. And then, like, this kind of thing happens. It's like. Right. Yeah. And and you know where this is going, right? Yeah. And and how even with a mother's best intentions, right. there are horrible, horrible people out there everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. Yeah. And with that said, not even a year after their move, their worst mm. fears took place. On June 10th of 1991. J.C. woke up. It was a school day, and it started off like any other day. In J.C.'s book, which I'm going to be referring to this book many, many times throughout this uh, story, and everything will be sourced in the show notes, so you guys can go there. I do highly recommend reading the books. She has her first book, which is A Stolen Life, and then her second book is called Freedom. It's a book of her firsts, but in this book, okay, so she explains that she was really irritated that morning and sad that her mom forgot to give her a kiss goodbye and that at the time she had kind of told herself she was going to be bringing it up later that day and holding it against her in a sense, like, oh, you forgot to give me a kiss goodbye for the day, and that moment would not be coming at all for years and years and years to come. Because as J.C. left that morning, not caring to interact with her stepfather, who she expresses, they were not close whatsoever. Um, It was very obvious to her and to others that he favored her half-sister more than her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which breaks my little heart. So that morning, you know, mom being gone, she had no reason to say bye to him. She went out the door like she normally does to go and walk towards the bus stop. While walking up the hill, a gray car approached J.C. Before she could even understand the magnitude of what was going on, she was tased by one of the passengers in the car. In her book, A Stolen Life, she says this about the moment she was taken. I hear a crackling sound and I feel paralyzed. I take staggering steps backwards, fear erasing everything but the need to get away. As the car door opens, I fall to the ground and I start to push back on my hands and butt towards the safety of the bushes. Scooting as fast as I can is my only goal, to make it to the bushes away from the man that is coming to grab me. My hands connect with something hard and sticky. What is it? It doesn't matter. I must hold on to it. She has a reflection section in the book where after each chapter, she talks about what she just wrote. Heather, before I continue, have you read this book? No. Okay, so I'll send it to you because I'm okay. done with it. So you need to. Just, I just know. putting that out it's, there. Yeah. It is, yeah. it is hard, but it is also a must read. Okay? Yeah. And if I could read a book, you could read a book. All right? That's <laughs> all I have to say about that. <laughs> so... I felt like this part was very important to bring up here. And the reason I wanted to bring up that moment is because in her reflections portion, she talks about collecting pine cones and how at being free and being out there in the real world, how she has them from places like Maine and Oregon. And then she says, a pine cone was the last thing I touched before I was taken away by Philip. A hard and sticky pine cone was my last grip on freedom before 18 years in captivity. Fuck. Philip Garrido is the man who abducted J.C. that day. In the car with him was his wife, Nancy Garrido. There's so much to say about the two of them, and I will be getting into more of these sick fucks, but that will be in part two. In this episode right now, we talk J.C., J.C. was a terrified 11-year-old girl, frozen in fear, gripping a pine cone. She was taken and put into the car. 
a blanket thrown over her body as her abductors drove off away from the bus stop where friends and schoolmates witnessed the kidnapping. And her stepfather, Carl, heard her screams in time to see the car as it zoomed off getting away. Uh. He got on a bike actually trying to chase the car as it sped away, but it was too late. She was gone. He So he was actually working on one of the vehicles in the yard, and as he heard the screams and he sees what's happening, there was a bike there, which was the closest thing. That's why he jumped on that bike trying to ride to her, where if he would have ran inside to get the car keys, yeah. then go back out there, who, yeah. who knows, but it's it's all just... So sad, so awful. He ends up telling the authorities immediately the details of the car and that there were two individuals, a man and a woman, inside of it. Instantly, they put up roadblocks. They pass on the information to any and everyone that they could. And this was before Amber Alerts were a thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, But with everything that they did, talking, you know, spreading the word, through the different departments and everything, nothing came of it. As the investigation started, Carl, the stepfather, was someone who was looked into right away. Makes sense. Last person to be seen with her Mm -hmm. and not believed to be the best relationship. Right. They also looked into her biological father, thinking, what if he came and tried to just get her himself? Which, that didn't happen. He had never even met her. Okay. But who was it? Who did this? Who took her? JC's mom, Terry, was devastated. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Something that Terry mentions, and so does JC in her book, is that after JC was abducted, they both would, so in interviews and in the book, they both talk about how the moon had meant everything to them. And they would look up at the moon to think mm-hmm. about each other and to try mm-hmm. to communicate and just hope that when one was looking at it, the other was too. And that somehow it was a connection for the both of them, knowing that they were looking at the same thing. Okay. Oh, my gosh. I know. So although the investigation continues and JC's mother, Terry, never gives up and constantly keeps JC's name as public and out there as possible – they mm-hmm. were not finding answers. They were not finding JC. And that is because the couple who abducted her took her back to their home where they had already set up a place for her and locked her away in it. And they abducted, they, they took her from South Lake Tahoe and drove back to Antioch, California, mm-hmm. hours away. JC's in this car, terrified, sitting there, blanket over her head, wondering what is going to happen. Oh There's a lot of backstory on Philip Greedo, and like I said, I'm going to be talking about that in part two, but tiny bit of over- overview like right now. He's a shitbag. One yeah. of the worst of the worst. Absolute yeah. garbage can of a fucking human being. He should have been locked up for years and years and years and years, but was let out on good behavior. From similar crimes to what I will be discussing in JC's case. Oh, he should have never. God. Oh, my. Say it again. Oh, my fucking God. Right. So I was I was talking about this because obviously I get so consumed in in the research and in what I'm doing and I was I was talking about this and being let out on good behavior. Okay. You're being let out on good behavior from a similar crime. So so you which he did. He was being he was arrested on rape charges, okay? Apparently, what he was raping, what he was doing, wasn't in the jail cell with him. It wasn't in prison. Like, they weren't yeah. there for him to do this yeah. to. Obviously, yeah. he's going to have good behavior. Yeah. Especially when you are a sex offender it, amongst like, a bunch of inmates who want to mess you up for being a oh, sex yeah. offender. Exactly. You're going to have really good behavior. You're going to do everything you can to get out of there because... Yeah. There's a really good chance. I yeah. So 
with that said, he should have never been released. He should have yeah. never been given the opportunity to do what he did the next 18 years. As they get to the Garrido home, they take JC inside the house. They walk her covered with the blanket still to a room in the back house on their property that he had set up for JC because, you know, look, this was all planned. It was all planned out. They had been scoping children. They were on the hunt for Ugh. a child for Philip, which ended up being this beautiful 11 year old girl, <sighs> JC. God. And they walk her into the house. That's not what I was going to say. There is video evidence of Philip and Nancy at a park, Heather, scoping out children. Ugh. He is playing guitar and singing. And Nancy is recording. But as she's recording, she's zooming in and, and panning off to the side to look at the children at the park. So I need to put this out there. You have to be aware of your surroundings. You need to report any suspicious behavior, whatever it is, while you are out. Because I hate him so much. Yeah. Yeah. But it is one of those things where you hear this. How many times are you listening to a true crime case or a true crime podcast? Because one of the things that you're doing is getting these things in your head to know what you would do in a situation. Yeah. Yeah. To know exactly, and, you know, we can say it all the time, you never know what you're going to do. You know what I'm going to do at a park? Fucking be aware of my surroundings. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm going to do at a park? If I see some fucking creeper staring at my kid, take my fucking kid with me and go somewhere else. Call the fucking cops. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I know that I mentioned this earlier, but I'm going to say it again right here. Trigger warning moving forward. I'm not going to say every single spot because so much of this is completely awful. All of it is. So with yeah. that said, this is your warning. I love you guys, and I need you guys to always protect your peace. If you choose to stay here, here we go. June 10th, 1991, the day that she was abducted, she was taken into a bathroom where Philip locked the door behind them, fear completely taking over every single aspect of of JC. She was asked to remove her clothing. In this bathroom was the first time that Philip undressed and JC was exposed to the disgusting monster in a whole other way. He told her to touch him. And in her book, she explains in such a childlike, completely innocent way, yeah. because that's what she was. She was. She yeah. was a fucking child. She goes from explaining how weird it looked, yeah, how she nervously laughed because yeah. she would laugh when she got nervous, a lot of and then do. It, a lot of people do. I sure fucking do. Yeah. And then she starts having all of the thoughts of being scared. She has all of the thoughts of wondering if anyone has told her mom where she is, oh and she God. begins to cry. She said Philip didn't really know what to do at that point. And said that that was going to be it for the day. He gives her a towel. She wraps herself back up. And Philip comforts JC by hugging her. Confusing this beautiful child, like, even more. Yeah. Then he proceeds to walk her to the back where there was a room, like I said, ready for her. And this would be the first day she was left in a room all alone in fear, in terror, lonely, cold, sad, wondering exactly what was going to happen to her. <sighs> God. In the first week being there, she was told by Philip that there were dogs outside. He had Dobermans that were his guard dogs and that she better not try to leave. And this is where she spent the next 18 years of her life. The first time that Philip sexually assaulted J.C., she wasn't aware of how long she had been in the room. She didn't know the last time she had ate. 
She knew the handcuffs around her hands were hurting and her skin was raw. The only thing JC would eat would be fast food that was brought and dropped off to her room. This day was a little different. He brought a milkshake with the food, which actually made JC very excited. He told her, though, she wasn't able to have it until after they were done. Philip raped JC for the first time that day. She tried to move away. She tried to close her legs. She cried. And when he was done, he has the nerve to ask her if she was okay. Yeah. Are you fucking kidding me? I'm not. And this is a repetitive. This is one of the things is that he always cried to her. He always begged her for forgiveness. He always said how sorry he was for doing this, which I will get into because he had this disability of sexual behavior that he couldn't control. And that's why she was there. Oh yeah. Cause that's his her fucking way. fault that he's a fucking. Nope. <gasps> so he told her he'd be back in a minute and he brings her a towel and warm water to help her clean up. She explains she was bleeding. She didn't know if she was dying since she really didn't understand what was going on. Yeah. He then proceeded to tell her that the next time it would be easier if she didn't resist or fight back. And then he left. After crying for hours, she realized that the milkshake that she was so excited for for that split second was sitting on the floor infested by ants. Mm -hmm. That was the first time that the assaults would take place. And then after that first time, they happened once a week for the next three years of J.C.'s life. (sighs) During this time, in the the first, I want to say, seven, eight months, she was moved actually into another room. It was a little bit bigger. At one point, she was even given a TV and could watch certain things at certain times. She often found herself falling asleep to infomercials because <laughs> he was doing his best at, I don't know how you would limit TV back then. I know that he had instilled so much fear in her and told right. her he could see everything she was doing. So, right. you know, I'm not really sure if you can just pick and choose a channel, you know, those old TVs. It's been yeah. a long time, girl, so I don't really know. But yeah. Um, he didn't want her on the news whatsoever because guess what? Her face was all over the fucking news. So that was pretty much it. She would just watch infomercials to fall asleep at that time. She was given a cat that she was so excited for to have something that was her own, something that she could care for and to keep company. But then it was taken because being locked in a room 24 seven wasn't the life for a cat. Yet apparently it was for J.C. Philip had no problem with that, you see, because he told J.C. that she was helping him and saving others from who he was. And because of J.C., other people were safe. Just, yeah, I know. I like pause to see because I, I know your mouth is moving, but it's the same thing over and over of like, yeah. what the fuck? Oh, my. Uh. Yeah. yeah no, I know. Thing. I know that there's not going to be a lot to say about all of this. But at any time, if you just need to just go off. Name call. No, no. Do I'm- you? <laughs> it's like it's so hard because like. I go back and forth from just like. The most rage. And then, like, just... not to cry. Yeah. Right. For this child. And then I just want to fucking beat up Yeah, this... I'm not even going to call him. Yeah, piece of shit. Piece of shit. Garbage man. Um, The fact that he 
And this is one of those things. There's so many things in this case, as I talk about it all today, that just kill me. And the fact that he could he could push this thought process onto her, and it is something yeah. that she she eventually came to. Oh, for to sure, say she's going to gonna internalize that stuff. It, I mean, yes. you're being told this every day from yes. the time that you're a very young child. Right. This is going to be internalized to you. This is all you know. This is your life. This is, no. I mean, there's no. Obviously, like that's going to get into your head. Right. You know, and it's that, like. Welcome to Sort of Kind of Funny. Uh, we're a comedy podcast. Brother and sister duo. Where we take your guys' embarrassing moments and stories and turn them into humor because life's about laughing at yourself and we are sure going to laugh at ourselves. I am James. I am your main Mac Daddy host. And I'm also joined by a loser. Go ahead and introduce yourself, loser. (laughs) Go ahead. Don't be shy. (laughs) This is Lauren. Give it to them. Absolutely. Absolutely. What are you? What are you shouting? Also, we sing a lot. So if you haven't listened to this first episode, (laughs) I'm sorry. We have new episodes available every Thursday and would love nothing more than to hang out with you. Does that sound too desperate? Yes. Okay. Check us out wherever you listen to your podcasts and we'll see you on Thursday. And as always... Text me if you want to hang out. Bye. And her, being who she is, came to to the point where she, you know, none of this was okay. She was never, she was never okay. Right. Obviously. But she did have those thoughts of, I'm happy it's not happening to happening to somebody else. Yeah. And, you know, he did say it's because he had this severe sexual problem and that's why he had her. And and the fact that he had her, others didn't have to go through it. And she she does. She talks about it in the book where she says, you know, she didn't want it to happen to other people. Right. But she didn't but want it, it to happen it to her either. To her. Yeah. No. Exactly. No. No. <sighs> for the runs which is worse so you guys bear with me philip showed up one day bucket of water and towel in hand which she instantly thought to herself no no fuck fuck no because she knew what that meant at that point but this time it was different he explained to jc that he would be doing a run They would be in this room the next few days where he would be doing crank, which is meth, and rape her over and over and over again. These runs became a common occurrence. Philip would do these god-awful things to JC, and then when he was done, he would make her listen to the voices inside of his head, and then he would cry like a little piece of shit bitch and apologize over and over and over again to JC. What the fuck? Yeah. Sorry. Just over here trying to breathe because my heart. My heart. Same. You want to know who else... Would cry and apologize to JC. Remember the other person who was in the car with Philip when JC was abducted? Fuck her too. Like his wife. Her his fucking wife, yeah. This Nancy. Bitch. Let's talk about her for a moment. Even though I despise her with every single part of my being. So Philip introduced Na- Nancy to JC about seven months into JC's captivity. Nancy would bring JC gifts and and I I want to say JC looked forward to these moments as this child who was being alone she does mm-hmm. say that at this point in her life that interaction that time with somebody else right. is what she needed because right. 
she was lost. It's the she was only lonely. positive, in, yes. like quote unquote positive interaction she's yeah. getting, right? Yeah. Exactly. And and you know they they would bring the food. Nancy would go and and spend some time with her and bring her those gifts. But then she would also just sit there and cry and apologize for what was going on. I mean, fuck them both. How do you have the nerve, the audacity to sit there and cry in front of this girl? Who is being every single parts of strength and yeah, amazing and just all of it. And you're sitting there crying. That I'm trying not to do. Fucking cowards. Fucking cowards. Pieces of shit. Just completely. Yeah. Yep. Ah, oh, there are no words for people like this. Like they 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 are just lower than low than low. Like they just Oh my god. I know. I know. So now JC has two people that she would be able to see at certain times, right? But JC describes Nancy as being evil and twisted. Not only did she help in the abduction, Mm -hmm. not only did she help in the search for children as they were trying to choose, not only did she get jealous of JC, yes, jealous of her. (laughs) My God. Nancy had the opportunity to make a difference and didn't fucking do it. Because after a year of JC being there, Philip went to prison for violating his parole by failing a drug test. And when this happened and he was gone for an entire month, an entire month, Nancy then became JC's primary caretaker, caretaker, fucking caretaker, captor. Yeah. Instead of releasing her and running for the fucking hills herself. What the actual fuck? At this moment, at this moment in time, so first of all, at this moment in time, I have chills all over my body. If you assisted this person, your husband, in doing these things, you're disgusting. You're awful. You're the worst. If you helped find this child and abduct this child, you are the worst. You deserve to be locked up. You have the chance. Seriously. To make that change for yeah. her, for you, you no longer get to cry about fucking shit. What the fuck? Yeah. Nope. Almost three and that's years. What's, that's Sorry. what's so crazy is like at any point, like this, again, I don't even want to call her a woman. Like this piece of shit number two could have gone to the cops. Right. Like, easily and said yep. this is what has been happening and it's like yeah you you sh- should have and would have done time for being an accomplice in all of this yep but it's like ugh, clear like you, you obviously you're incapable of doing the right thing but it's like it's oh so, it's very obvious oh, yeah oh my god yep. oh my god the worst of the worst this segment today is brought to you the the worst of the worst segment. Seriously. <laughs> oh my god. Almost 3 years Heather after JC was taken, she was brought her first home cooked meal. Oh my god. She ate fast food literally the entire time she was there. And on Easter of 1994, Philip and Nancy both brought JC food. And it was during this time that they informed JC that she was pregnant. (gasps) She was 13 years old at this time. Oh, my God. She was only 13 years old. Oh, my God. She spent the next few months watching anything she could find on TV about pregnancy and giving birth. Knowing that they could not take JC to the doctor's, Philip told JC he was going to learn how to deliver the baby himself. Oh, my God. He watched videos. 
He read up on it. He said that, you know, that's what he was going to do. And that's exactly what he did. JC was in her room and was going into labor. She was alone. There's that part that also just is so awful. She was alone, no way to contact them. A 14, she was 14 at the time of the birth. 13 when she got pregnant, 14 at the time of the birth, and she's in this room alone experiencing something she knows little to nothing about. Oh my god. In a abduction situation, she starts to have all these pains and you know, she's wondering what's going to happen. Right. Philip and Nancy went to check on her later that night to find her having her contractions and ready to give birth. JC had her first daughter that day in the room where she was being held captive for years. This was such a big moment in her book. This is how she explains it. After that, they gave her to me to hold for the first time. And then they cleaned up all the mess and changed my sheets. I am exhausted and all I want to do is go to sleep. I nurse her for the first time, which feels very strange to me. And then we both go to sleep. JC's first daughter was born at 4.35 a.m. August 18th of 1994. JC was only 14 years old. She was very scared. But now she had her baby girl. Baby A. She did. They And I'm not going to say names. So that's baby A. Again, I cannot stress this enough of how highly I recommend you all to go and read the book. I have been referencing this whole time, okay? Stolen Life. But I wanted to say, you know, we, we talk about this being our mom cast and how we try to focus highly on mom related cases. And as an outsider, as a mother, I am so happy she was able to have this baby. Baby A, something to call her own, something to make her feel, something to be connected to. Yeah. She was a mom. JC was a mom. In the beginning, in the the early ages of Baby A's life, JC would sing to her, play games. And then it was a lot of feed and sleep and sleep and feed because they lived in a room. One day... Nancy had brought in a bird cage. It was a little cockatiel saying that it was hers. It was Nancy's. But she thought that JC could spend some time with it so that she can have someone to talk to. Something to talk to. Fucking oh bitch. JC named the bird Sergeant or Sarge for short. She spent so much time with this bird. Being patient and kind and warm to this bird until it became friendly. Because one of the things is that Nancy had told her, like, do not touch the bird. The bird bites. Like, do not touch this bird. And guess what? JC touched the bird. She slowly but surely put her hand in that cage every it's time. So, oh my God. It's like, so this breaks my heart because you have this child who, for the last. Three, four years at this point has had nothing but horrible, horrible treatment. And then here she is, four years into this fucking nightmare with the strength and the patience and then just like the the literal like goodness of her and who she is to be a baby raising a baby, Mm -hmm. which in and of itself takes all of your patience and strength. And then you can see the amount of kindness and patience she has for this other life of this bird that she's willing to like do this. And it's like, it's so crazy and it speaks volumes to who she is as a person the fact that she could be living 
in utter darkness, nightmare, the worst possible thing, and not have let that change who she is and how she treats others. Yep. Including animals. Like... Including animals, which is a big part of a lot of this story because, I mean, as as I said, I mentioned it earlier where they bring her the cat and then they take that cat away. That happens numerous times. And I can't I can't bring up every single time that they bring her something and take something away because it's it's too much. But the the reoccurring factor of this is their garbage. Yeah. And she deserves so much more. Yeah. That bird, you know, like like I was saying, she eventually had kind of like nurtured it enough for that bird to trust her and would be able to go on her hand. And any time Nancy was there, she would never let her know that. She would never yeah. let her know that because she told her no. But Philip, on the other hand, there were the times that, you know, she would say like, hey, look what I can do because she needed that that release of like showing yeah. someone else what is going on. For and sure. so each night, so, you know, over the summer, Nancy would hang the cage outside to give the birds some some of that, you know, warm summer days. And then JC said that she would always remind Nancy to take it inside. One day, it wasn't very hot outside. It was cold. Nancy forgot to take the bird in. Mm. Hours later, Nancy brought it to JC, and she was just so happy to see the bird was okay. Mm -hmm. The next morning, JC woke up, and she didn't hear Sarge's little feet in the cage. When she went to check on him, she saw that he was dead on the bottom of the cage. Oh, my gosh. Nancy wouldn't even go to see JC at this point because she knew JC would blame her and hold it against her. Yeah. Which, of course, she fucking would. Of course yeah. she did. <sighs> but I'm really, I, I thank you. I really feel like it was very important for you to just show how, how, that, how she is and, like, how mm-hmm. just caring and nurturing and strong she mm-hmm. is through all of this. One thing about baby A coming into the picture is that the assaults were happening a little less. One time is too many, obviously, but still they did become to be less frequent. One of the reasons for this is because he wasn't doing as much drugs at the time because he was... um, He had became very passionate in his religion and his faith don't get me wrong. None of that fucking matters. <laughs> what a fucking joke. Because, I yeah. Just, I mean, so, okay. So, I'm like, I, I have a lot of mixed feelings about that. What, on one hand, I have the feeling of like, hey, if that's going to keep you from, you know, assaulting her as much as you have been, all all the God in the world, like, fuck Power yeah. to you. Go, right. but, yeah, do, do it right. And then on the other hand, I'm like, if you're so into your religion, what the fuck are you doing? Right. Welcome to the Dead Podcast. I'm your host, Desi. And on this podcast, I discuss all things spooky and weird. From ghosts, demons, religion, to folklore, urban legends, true crime, and all things paranormal, with some horror movie reviews sprinkled in. So join me on this spooky ride. Yeah, you're definitely not wrong because, I mean, I this is, so even though they became less frequent because, and this is, she explains it as he was, Spending so much time reading the Bible, trying to, you know, he started his own church. Okay. Yeah. So the fact that he, he was doing so much other stuff, but it didn't matter for him because the runs were still happening. 
Right. Because he is a filthy pig shit. They're still happening. Okay. And at 17, JC can tell that she's pregnant again. God. She's going to be having her second baby in her captor's home by her captor. At this point, she had been there for over six years. Pregnant, mother of baby A, being held captive by a couple who truly believes that they are this super happy family. God. Philip and Nancy are fixing up the yard so that JC and the babies will have more space. They bring her a red bunk bed which they thought she would love the color, which she says she definitely did not love the color. They knew nothing about her. Yeah. But it was the first time that they would have space sleep-wise. Not only did she get the bunk bed, apparently a neighbor couldn't care for a guinea pig. So Philip got the guinea pig for Jace, JC as well. This house, so you know what? I should have probably started with this, so I apologize for this. But this property, if you can just picture walking up to a house, and it's it's a decent-sized lot, right? You walk up to the house, and then when you go to the back, there's other b- little buildings, sheds, studio-type things, and then behind mm-hmm. that, there's like a gate, a fence, where you think that it's done. You think mm-hmm. that that's it. But it's not. You go back there and there's more. Okay. This is where she was being held. And so it was like at first she was closer. And then, like I had mentioned earlier, in the in the when she was first taken there, she was in this tiny room. And then seven, eight months in, she got moved to another room, which was like the studio room. That's where she would be. It was a little bit bigger. Then in time she ended up going into the yard and she was able to go outside and take her girls outside. But we'll we'll get into that. So it's like Sorry, I should have kind of painted that a little bit uh, more earlier. But back to this guinea pig, okay? So JC was eager to care for this guinea pig, which Nancy, she wanted to call this guinea pig uh, Guinevere. JC wasn't about it. She was watching a show called Seventh Heaven, Mm -hmm. which so did I every single Monday night. It was our family's (laughs) thing. And JC named the guinea pig. Oh, I can't say it. She named it Happy, which was the dog's name. The dog. Yeah, their little like white dog. Yep. Oh my god. Sorry, that just ooh my heart. And she said that even though Nancy would go in there and call the guinea pig Guinevere, she just. Shrugged it off and knew in her heart, you know, this is happy. (laughs) This is happy. November 13th, 1997, JC gives birth to her second child, another beautiful baby girl. Baby S was born at 2.15 a.m. Obviously, it was another home birth. Yeah. JC and baby A, well... So JC started feeling her contractions. She could tell that she was going into labor. At this point, she was she wasn't she was able to go into the house um if she if she needed something. So she would go over there. So she walked over to get Philip and Nancy walking with baby A. They jumped into action. Apparently, Dr. Fuckface begins helping JC while Nancy goes in the other room and turns on the TV to not have to pay attention to JC. After this, Philip only had runs with Nancy. He no longer did them to JC. JC spent her time caring for her two girls, baby A, and then baby G, because she said S didn't suit her. So it was baby G. <laughs> and J.C. and the two girls were in their room together and their little backyard together. As I say that, I kind of brushed over it pretty quickly, but the, the time that 
he had gotten JC pregnant was mm-hmm. the last time that he sexually assaulted her. Mm-hmm. There were no more runs, and he did start having those runs with Nancy instead, which obviously she was willing and volunteering that, and that was not what JC was enduring, obviously. Yeah. Um, but JC knew it because he would even tell her, like, you know, I'm not doing this anymore or at the moment, you know. Yeah. And I don't think he ever gave her that knowledge that, hey, this ain't ever going to happen to you again. Right. But she did know she was aware because he would straight up tell her, like, all right, you won't see us for a couple of days. We'll be, you know, doing the drugs and doing the runs or however the fuck. I don't even know how that shit works. It makes no fucking sense to me. But anyways, Philip had started a printing business from their home. He started out actually while JC was pregnant with baby G and JC actually started working for him. She liked to work for the company. It kept her busy. Yeah. It gave her something to do. Yeah. And it was from the home, right? Yeah. So many people have their thoughts, their theories, their, if it were me, I would have done this. But so right. many do not understand why JC was be- beginning to have more leniency. She was being able to go outside and then also being able to work for this company, making calls and emails. Something to remember, though, something she explains is that although things were different in like a little way, she was still being held captive. Philip made it very clear that he would hurt the girls if she tried to leave or do anything. He made it very clear that he could see and hear every single thing she was doing on the computer and on that phone for work. She Mm -hmm. was not free, not any of the time that she was in the Garrido home. And I just, I need that to be so very clear to anyone who thinks otherwise. And what you have to realize too, at this point, it's been what, seven, eight years of this life. Now it's not just you. You have to worry about it. She is two other human beings that you need to you know, worry about. And at this point you have literally grown up in fear. You have literally grown up and it is conditioned in you. Right. Right. Like what, what the, what your circumstances are. Right. I mean, yeah, like that's, and now you're not just, like I said, you're not just scared. Like that fear and that conditioning is not just on you. It, you're sitting there like thinking like, I need to make sure like my girls are not ever going to go through what I went through. So like, you know, she's she has to be extra careful for them. Yes, she does. And she was. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're about to be really mad. <sighs> Matter than I already am. Yeah, this is going to really make you mad. So after she had baby G, something changed and breaks my fucking heart. So Nancy ended up leaving her job. And since she was home and no longer working, she had a lot of free time to sit and dwell on all of the awful things that she had done in the past. JC had been there for years. She had two babies there. Philip pays a lot more attention to her and the girls. Nancy was a jealous bitch. She expresses her, you know, her feelings to Philip about her jealousy and just JC being there and everything. And then Philip goes to talk to JC about Nancy's feelings and her strugglings because JC cares about that for some not not that's a joke. And with that conversation, He tells her that the girls are going to call Nancy mom and that JC needed to come up with a name for her to be called her sister. Yeah. For her daughters to call her her sister instead. Oh, 
My fucking God. If you're so mad about this, Nancy, then do the right fucking thing. Like, what the fuck? What? <sighs> Are you struggling with planning your trip to Morocco? If this sounds like you, you should check out our podcast. Destination Morocco Podcast. We talk about all things Morocco, from scams to culture, history, and activities. Our goal is to help travelers like yourself plan their dream vacation to Morocco by creating personalized itineraries that will make you enjoy Morocco like a native. To find out more, listen to our podcast, Destination Morocco Podcast. I want to throw my. <laughs> I'm so. I just like, want to throw my shaking. computer. I'm shaking, but it's already broken. I can't me. breathe, and I'm shaking. Like this is, what the fuck? Isn't that disgusting? It's. That is disgusting. For you, for you to feel that you have any. I don't even know the right word because I just I'm so upset and angry right now. But to even think that you're allowed to have these feelings or yeah. that yeah. Well, any of them are valid right. whatsoever yeah. is just so insane to me. Yeah. It is so insane to me. So like I have never in my life like heard of a more irrational fucking yeah. argument. I no. swear to fucking God. So that's what she has to do. JC comes up with a new name, and that new name is Alyssa. JC spent the next many, many years raising her daughters, helping to homeschool them, love them, give them what she wished she had, the love she desired. JC, you know, she was only fifth grade she only had a fifth grade education when she was taken right and now she is 18 ish around the time of what i'm talking about right now Mm -hmm. 19 20 going into that age you know just moving forward with a fifth grade education yeah and then doing the best she can doing the best she can but learning with her children yeah and 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 providing and giving them anything that she could. In J.C. Dugard's book, the next part is a whole bunch of journal entries over the next few years. This was a way for her to let things out, a release. She had to keep it hidden. Right. One of her entries comes from July 5th, 2004. Again, she was taken 1991. This is July 5th of 2004. It feels like I'm sinking. I'm afraid I want control of my life. This is supposed to be my life to do with what I like. But once again, he has taken it away. How many times is he allowed to take it away from me? I am afraid he doesn't see how the things he says makes me a prisoner. Why don't I have control over my life? That's heartbreaking. That's it, so fucking hard. It really is. It's so, and what's so amazing, it's just like a testament to her mental strength that she still sees that, like, this isn't like my life like he has control of my life like this isn't right you know the fact that she still is having that those thoughts that like this isn't the way it's supposed to be and she hasn't completely given into the situation right. despite everything that she's been through and no one would have blamed her if she no longer thought that and that this was just like she was resigned to her fate in in this like you know yeah. no one would have blamed her it would yeah. have been completely understandable but right. like again just like how mentally strong she is to be to be writing this 
what, 13 years into this at this point. And like, uh, that's, wow. It's amazing. It really is. She is truly amazing, which you'll see. One of the things that you see, like, in the book, but so you see these journal entries, but you you see throughout the entire book from her early writings and recollections and then being about her mom, her um, life. Yeah. She wrote about her family and wondered whether they were looking for her. And then in time, however, her isolation and, and depression led her to to crave any type of of yeah. human interaction, yeah. even if that came from the Garritos. Yeah. Which they did not deserve. <sighs> Monday, August 24th of 2009, JC was 29 years old at this point. Oh Philip God. went to UC Berkeley to try to get a permit to distribute flyers on campus. You know, because he was this big religious man and wanted to distribute some uh, uh, of his church flyers, okay? He ended up bringing his two daughters with him. They were 15 and 11 at the time, Heather. Oh, my God. The fact that he was so delusional, I almost said the word confident, but delusional in the sense that he thought he could take these two girls out of the house, which he did. This is not the first time he took them out of the yeah. house, right? And and JC has been out of the house with him, you know? So it's yeah. like, it's not the first time. But the fact that he just lived his life like this, thinking that all of it was okay, is just absolutely mind-blowing. But... They were 15 and 11 at the time. Lisa Campbell, who worked for Berkeley in the um, events department, said that her mothering instincts were off watching these two girls. Mm -hmm. One who was just staring up into the air. One of the girls was staring up into the air. She asked Garrido to come back tomorrow to discuss his requests. Um, They would have, you know... Another conversation tomorrow to talk about that. And once they had left, Lisa Campbell then went to a fellow Berkeley officer, Allie Jacobs, who ran a background on Garrido and saw that he was a sex offender. He came back the next day and both of the girls were with him again. So, and, and I, so the reason, JC says, the reason that he would take the girls is he thought people took him more seriously, especially like when it came to what he was trying to do and like preach Mm -hmm. and talk his faith and all of those kind of things. Seeing that he has these two girls with him, people would, you know, take him more seriously and let him more approachable or whatever the fuck he thought in his brain. Yeah. So he goes back to, you know, talk about this request further And according to Jacobs, both daughters were robotic, extremely pale to the point of being almost gray and with non-responsive bright blue eyes. So Garrido confessed to the officers that his life had changed and that he was on parole for a rape that that happened 33 years ago. Mm -hmm. As Jacobs watched the girls just wondering, you know, like something is off. Yeah. Something is off. Yeah. She's, they just sat there. They sat there with no emotion. She, so like one of the, one of the ladies, Lisa Campbell, she would take Garrido, have a little conversation while, um, Allie would sit there and talk with the girls and kind of like interact with them to, to read their body language, to see how they act. And it was just not something normal for a 15 and 11 year old right um jacobs was actually trying to figure out how to keep garrido there longer to try to figure out more but it wasn't an option at the time so once he left 
Allie Jacobs and Lisa Campbell call his parole officer to explain the weird feelings and their concern for his daughters. Yeah. That's when the parole officer said, Greedo doesn't have any daughters. Oh, my fucking God. It was that moment, and my mama heart is instantly pounding, that they knew they needed to do something and they needed yeah. to do it quickly. Yeah. I love Lisa Campbell. I love her. She's like, don't cry because I'll cry. Oh my God. She's a fucking You have to trust human. those instincts. You, you have really to trust do. your gut. You have to know, especially as a mother, that if you sense something is off, something is probably off. And we say it all the time. You see something, you hear something, you say something. And obviously, you know, she was so smart. She's so smart. Yeah. She's so, she's like, oh, let me, let me. Let's I discuss like this, this situation. further tomorrow. Yes. Can you come back tomorrow? Right. Meanwhile, I'm going to go talk to my m- other amazing friend who has killer instincts. Yep. And can sense these things too. And it's just amazing that, huh. Whew. Thank you, Lisa. Yes. Thank you, Lisa. On the 25th, Nancy ran into the house saying that Philip had been arrested. JC was the one trying to calm Nancy down in this awful situation, <laughs> telling her that everything's going to be fine. But it wasn't long after that that Philip walked through the door with his parole officer. Uh huh. So his parole... Okay, I'm going to let you keep going. Yeah, yeah, just... It's it's this part. It's coming. It's coming together, my dear. And and no, his parole officer didn't just... Yeah, okay, let me just tell you, okay? Because I feel like I already know your question, and you're about to get really, really fucking pissed. So, in, in the book, JC, she says, you know, this as her feelings at this moment. After many hours of holding it together, I finally lost it and started to cry. I probably looked to everyone like I was relieved to have him back, but the truth is on the inside, I felt like they were tears of anger. Yes, I was angry, angry at everything, angry at the parole agent for taking him and then not taking him. His parole officer told Philip to report the next day to the Concord police and he walked out the door. Hey there, true crime fans. Are you looking for a podcast that combines your love of crime stories with a good laugh? Look no further than the ODFM podcast. It's hosted by Kelly DeVries and Jenna Swanson. Kelly and Jenna take you on a wild ride with their unique blend of humor and gripping storytelling. From bizarre murders to unsolved mysteries, all while keeping it light with their quick wit and relatable banter. Subscribe now wherever you get your podcasts. ODFM, where true crime meets comedy and the laughs are killer. I hope the parole officer got motherfucking fired. If he didn't, I don't. I I need to look that up now because I don't know if he did, but I really don't see how you don't. The minute, the minute that that, that they called that parole officer and they said he walked in with those two daughters, it is his fucking job to check in on that. You know that th- what this man's history is. You are you fucking kidding me? Nope. Oh my god. Philip, JC, G and A all show up to the office the next day. All four of them. They walk up to the door. The night before, Philip had a conversation with JC and he told her to admit that she is the girl's mother and that she knew all along that Philip was a sex offender and that she willingly had the girls with him. When they walked through the doors, someone said that the girls had to be separated. They weren't allowed to be in that area. They began taking Philip one way and JC another. 
my God. She looked back at him with her eyes questioning what to do. And he winked at her. Oh, my God. They took Philip and they questioned him. They took JC and they questioned her, where she gave every single answer that they had practiced the night before. Pretended everything was fine. I'm, I, (laughs) he's, like you said, he's fucking delusional because how old are you today, JC? I'm 29. How old is your daughter? 15. So you were 14 when you gave birth to her. Yes. And you willingly did this with this motherfucker. Uh, yes. No, you didn't because you're 14 fucking years old. And the fact that he thought that, oh, yeah, I can just make her tell them that she willingly at 14 year old, 14 years old had my baby and I'll be in the clear. Are you fucking kidding me? You idiot. He's he's the worst. He's <sighs> freaking the worst. Um, It doesn't get that far for the rest of that because... You know, th- their spidey senses were up. Well, yeah. They were Everyone on. except that fucking parole officer, because what that the fuck, That parole officer dude? and Philip, because he's, oh, my God. Peas at a pod, those two motherfuckers. <sighs> They're both in there. They're both having their questioning and all of that, right? And she's lying about right. everything to this person. Okay? Yeah. So at this point, she's sitting in there and JC sees Philip being led out in the handcuffs. He's being taken away. And it was this moment for her where she's like, what is, what is going on? Yeah. And he tells her, him, Philip, tells her like, it's over. It's up. Say it, you know? And so then in that moment – is when the person sitting with her tells her to get a lawyer. And in this moment, she's thinking, why do I need a lawyer? Because I didn't do anything wrong, right? They don't know who she is. During questioning, they begin to ask all of the right questions. Because remember, she goes in there as Alyssa. She's Alyssa when she goes into that office, which during, and and, I mean, you bring up those numbers, I don't know exactly the conversation that Philip had with those people, but that fucker apparently said something. So they ask her. They they ask her what her name is. She says she couldn't say it. Eventually, <gasps> they ask her if she was kidnapped. She said yes. How old were you when you were kidnapped? She was 11. How old are you now? I'm 29. <laughs> the interrogating officers continued asking her, What is your name? You know, because she said Alyssa. She finally said, I can't say it, but I can write it out for you. On a paper. Fuck. On a paper, shaking like crazy, she wrote, J.C. Lee Dugard. It was the first time she had even said her name, well, wrote her name down, but after she wrote it, she said it, in 18 years. This relief of writing her name followed where she wrote her birthday, and she wrote her mom's name, and then they brought her girls into the room with her because they knew what was going on, brought the girls to her, The officers knew exactly who she was and brought up her mom. And JC said, wait, can I see my mom? And the officer said, yes. From the police station, she called her mom. Oh, my God. She got to hear her mom's voice for the first time in 18 years. She doesn't recall the entire call because she said she was at such a loss for words that she didn't remember what she said. But her mom, I know, I know. Her mom in the interview says that she said, (laughs) she said, she just told me she had babies and come quick. And JC remembers hearing her mom scream, my daughter has been found. Oh, Mm. my God. I'm so glad you can't really see me. You guys, this part is so hard. It's so hard because the whole thing is so hard. 
But yeah. knowing that this is the moment that all of that ends. Mm. Okay, I'm going to be strong the rest of it, I promise. Yeah, okay, because I'm not. <laughs> you don't have to be. I'll be strong. I need to be strong. <laughs> J.C. Lee Dubard was kidnapped just a minute away from her home, June 10th, 1991. She was freed August 26th of 2009 after 18 years of being held captive. And when I say freed, freed from her captor, now being exposed to a world she knew little to nothing about as a mother of two. On top of writing two books, A Stolen Life and Freedom, a book of firsts, on top of reuniting with her family and friends, on top of countless days of trying to help understand and, and cope with a life that was taken from her for far too long, on top of being a mother, J.C. Lee Dugard started the Jace Foundation, and this is what it says in the About section on the website. I should have made you read this. <laughs> J.C. Lee Dugard. She is the founder of the Jace Foundation. In 1991, I was abducted walking to the school bus. I was 11 years old. When I was recovered from my captors 18 years later, my family needed help reconnecting. The process required an extensive multidisciplinary approach to get through a very difficult transition in our lives. We needed protection, expertise, support, and the ability to make choices as we started our healing journey. I believe that families... Dang it, I looked at you, and then Sorry. I should have cried. I'm it's really okay. trying not if to If I just look at my this. thing, I only cry when I look at you. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I believe that families who survive major life traumas need and deserve the kind of support we received. Because of this belief, my family has formed the Jace Foundation. Jace stands for Just Ask Yourself to Care. This, this foundation, Heather, is first of all amazing, but throughout the entire story, we bring up all of the animals yeah. that were brought into her. And so much of this reconnecting is through animals and their yeah. ability to help you heal. It's a beautiful, beautiful foundation that she started. Okay. But Jace stands for just ask yourself to care. Ooh, I gotta just be able to read. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. Well, this part's going to be hard for me to read. J stands for just ask yourself to care. Can you do that? Can you ask yourself to care? No. <laughs> I mean, Sorry. yes, I can. We're breaking down over here. <laughs> Remember how you said you want to be been professional? A while. I know. We can't. <laughs> Jace stands for just ask yourself to care. Can you do that? Can you ask yourself to care for JC, for her girls, for her family, and then think about how we can care and what we can do for the hundreds of thousands of missing children and people out there that deserve to be searched for and found. JC was searched for. Her mom never gave up. Her mom knew she was alive, and she spoke about it in every interview. Mama intuition is a thing, but in many other areas... Not enough was done. Philip was sentenced to 431 years to life in prison. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> in June of fucking 2011. California doesn't have the death penalty still on. I mean, they do, but it's whatever. It's sign being, me up. Seriously, I will sign a fucking petition today. <laughs> Nancy was sentenced to 36 years to life. She should fucking die in prison, too. As far as They're I'm both concerned. up for parole in 2034. Okay. No. They'll be dead. I hope so. I'm sorry. I know that's, it's like, okay. such a bad thing to say, but, mm -hmm. like, it's I... Hard. Anything kid-related, you instantly have those feelings. It is, yeah. it is hard, and it is, you know... But, like, I... Yeah. Prison justice just... 
works in mysterious ways. And How did you say it that I, one time? Jailhouse justice? Is that two yeah. words? Jailhouse <laughs> Did I, did I say that? I think you were like, two words for you. Two words. Jailhouse, Jailhouse justice. justice. Honestly, honestly, it works in mysterious ways. And I will leave it up to yeah. karma. Yep. For them so, to get what they deserve. Which I'm sure they will. <clears throat> this so So this is all I have for you guys today for this. But I, I do have a little bit more pertaining to this in a sense. I didn't want to have to do this. I I know I mentioned it earlier. I didn't want to have this together because JC deserves to be as freed from this piece of shit. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, and I mentioned him enough in this episode because he is a part of her story and, and I'm so glad he's not anymore. There will be a part two. It'll be short but we need to discuss Philip and Nancy and how the system failed JC. 100%. How they're... No, go ahead. It's, it's in that's I'm it's hard because like you and I are both 100% on the same page when it comes to this. Like we don't like to give the time of day to these pieces of shit, but there's a lot of things that unfortunately you learn from the background that you will be going over right. in, like you said, how the system fucking failed. Yes. And and even though it should not be something, like, it's it's not, <laughs> it shouldn't be your or my or the any mom's responsibility to have to, it sucks to have to think, like, I need to, like, it's our responsibility to care for our kids, 100%. But, like, the fact that I'm sure the things you're going to be going over is, like, things that now me, you, and all the moms listening are going to be like, well, now I need to start thinking about that every time I go to the park or every time this happens or every time that happens. Right. And it's it's hard because, like, we already carry so much responsibility, you know, and it just sucks that there are people in this fucking world – that have that because they're just pieces of shit. Now we have that much more that we are thinking about yep. to protect our children. Yep. And so it's going to be like, it, it's still, it's not important to go over him because he doesn't fucking matter. Fuck him and fuck Nancy. But it is important to discuss the, the fails in the system and potentially what, you or uh you know other moms myself what we can do you know to try to protect our kids even though we shouldn't have to add those extra things to our life no i mean you're right and that is you make a good point and we shouldn't and that is our job that is what we do and the thing the best thing we can do moving forward is hold people accountable accountable in their jobs Mm -hmm. and in their positions because as Mm -hmm. i will get to there were chances you know as there if only people took another step yeah they were at that house they're they were at that house heather we're gonna get into it so that's why like lisa campbell i will remember which i yeah so i'm gonna her and ali jacobs so that's another thing so lisa campbell ali jacobs mama intuition I am going to be talking about her um, on Thursday, you guys. So this comes out Tuesday. On Thursday, we have a bonus episode coming out. And I'll be talking about these two, both of them, two beautiful mothers and their, you know, ability to trust their instincts Mm -hmm. and – and trust their feelings in in a moment. And yes, this is what they are trained for. This is what they, you know, you you, you want to think everyone's trained in their jobs, and maybe you can take a training. But yeah, that that intuition, yeah, that isn't always trainable, guys. No. <laughs> that, that right there, Imagine you either have if, it or you don't. And I and I hate to say, I hate to. Say say it like this because I know that there are so many fathers out there that this doesn't apply to but like what are the odds of of 
of it having gone down that way if he had ran across a man who didn't have kids? Would that instinct probably not. have been the same? Maybe. I'm not saying that there's not instinctual males out there who would have noticed that something was off, right? Yeah. But I'm sure you're going to go through the fact that there was several people who witnessed shit and just, yes. mur, 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 yep. you know, because that instinct wasn't there. So just, yeah, like you said, shout out to that mother instinct, that mama bear, that fucking saved yes. lives. Yes. So you guys, that that's pretty much it. My entire heart goes out to JC and her girls. And I'm so thankful that you get this chance at life that yeah. you so very much deserve. And For sure. she's out I, there I just, doing the darn thing. Rachel. Yeah. When no, you cover No. no. <laughs> I was like, don't Sorry. say anything about how I covered it because look, I me, was just gonna my little me... crybaby, sad <laughs> self, couldn't even hold it together to There's, get a sentence I have out. So many words. But that's because that's the thing is like, so when you cover cases like this, like when you start these cases, I'm always like, God, what the fuck, Rachel? Why? <laughs> Why are you doing this to us? Like, this is so fucking hard. This is so this is so difficult. But then, you know, I always have the thought, too, of like her story deserves to be heard. Yes, it does. Her strength deserves to be admired, celebrated and admired. Yes. Exactly. So that is amazing. And 100 percent, I'll do a million episodes like this if I can tell stories about a badass fucking woman like JC. And then the fact that like I don't <laughs> like the ending was cuz we have covered cases that didn't have endings like this, right? right. That didn't yeah. have, you know, and and so the that we got to celebrate that moment with like her reuniting you know, and her yeah, being able to reclaim so, her life and and have that that is it's such a big deal it is and yeah. um as um as mothers i think we're both just like super i mean as it is i feel like you and i are both already just kind of empaths and we feel oh, a lot Jesus, especially as i wish like i could just tone it down a little bit <laughs> i know but like that's who we are right i know and then know, when yeah. when you throw mother stuff into it like i think like our like our levels shoot super high and so um where was i going with this oh yeah like you said like being able to s celebrate like that moment and just be so happy for her and her mom and her girls for yeah. all of it to just finally be over Oh, it's like an amazing thing. And um, so thank you for taking me on this and our listeners on this emotional roller coaster. And like you said, JC. Wow. <laughs> She's an amazing human being. She really is. She really is. Amazing. And I know that I said it. I probably said it more times than I needed to, but I, and I do have more sources than just her book, believe it or not. <laughs> um, I could have just used her book because that's yeah. the thing is I need to read more books. Number one, um, <laughs> being able to get so much of her thoughts and what yeah. she was going through, I feel like is so important in this case. And and oh, yeah. one of the main things, my main takeaways from bringing this to you guys today is the fact that I do feel like her voice was heard throughout this. And I hope yes. that you guys do too. Yes. Um, I 100% recommend and everything will be sourced in the show notes. But the book, uh, A Stolen Life by J.C. Dugard, and then also Freedom. It's the book of her firsts after she is out and living her life. Go and buy those and read those. 
If you feel ever so inclined, go look at her website just because it gives you just even more of just this view of who she is and what mm-hmm. she does. It She's really amazing. gives She's it amazing. really gives her story just like it's justice for her story being able to tell it in her own words. It's right. it's and it's important that wherever possible yeah, you incorporate those into, you know, like what we're doing because, right. you know, her perspective on everything that was happening is so important, even more important than the, the you know, base facts of the case, right? Yep. Because this was a human life. And yep. so her views of it is so incredibly important. And so I'm, yep. you know what, Rachel, you've been You're reading right them it. books and you've been bringing those what? book episodes and I'm, I'm here for it. Super so here proud for of it. myself. You should be. <laughs> for reading books. Um, but that's it, you guys. Uh, everything will be sourced in the show notes. Go check her out. You guys also stay tuned. So actually, not even stay tuned. After this, right now, I do have... Um, the other episode is out for you guys right now. I hope that you guys didn't start there. Well, yeah, that we'll put sucked. a disclaimer at the front of that <laughs> episode that says, yes. "That says." I was like, "Stop! Wait, how go, <laughs> go back and one. listen to the part one first, and then yes. come back here." <laughs> that that is available right now for you guys to go and listen if you guys want to. It really, you're going to get a lot of insight on things that could be different, things that can be changed. The what ifs, the what yeah. ifs, and, and, and it's hard, um, but it's, it's needed and it's necessary mm-hmm. to, to do that as well. And then also on Thursday, we do have an episode coming out and it's, it's going to be, in my opinion, my very unbiased opinion, just kidding. Um, just such a very special episode. It's going to be such a strong, strong episode. And it's not just brought to you guys by Heather and I. We have some amazing ladies joining us to uh, bring this episode for International Women's Day. And we're going to be a bunch of badass women bringing you stories of a bunch of other badass women, okay? So that will be dropping on Thursday. So look for that. Make sure you hit subscribe if you are not subscribed so far so that you get those when they come out. And until uh, that happens, I hope you guys have a really, really good day. (laughs) (laughs) We're going to try not to cry as we tell you. Okay, love you, bye. <laughs> Kay, love you, bye. <laughs> Just kidding. Kay, love you, bye. I'm Thomas. And I'm Jake. And this is A Call to Madness. This is a comedy show where we have no idea where these topics will take us. Whether it be history, relevance between us, or all around straight madness. Learn with us, throw with us, and laugh with us every other Saturday at noon central time on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Just remember, guys. You called, but you only found madness. Madness.